Uh, we will call the meeting to order. This is the May 2nd meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, Wintrow. Here. McQueen. Yes. Simplain. Here. Uh, Gerald Sims is out ill this evening, and Brian Housh is absent due to a work commitment. Also present is uh, Village Manager Penny Bates, Assistant Village Manager Melissa Van Zandt, and our solicitor Chris Connor should be here shortly. Great. Well, I don't know what we're going to do without Brian's announcements. I'll yeah. do a couple, though. Um, on um, Thursday, May 19th, uh, the Chamber will be hosting a business after hours at Mills Park Hotel. That's from 5.30 to 7.30. There will be something on our website, and I would ask for people to um, uh, RSVP ver uh, via that website. Um, on Friday, May 27th, the um, mobile uh, mammography and bone density truck will be in town here at the Bryan Center. Mm -hmm. um, that is from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Will it be back in the back? We're going to uh, um, put it over by the, uh, the ramp that goes up to the okay. white trail back in that corner. So it will be close to, uh, close to the Dayton Street side, and there will obviously be parking easily available and um, there is the ability to either use your own insurance or there is um, uh, I think that there is some financial aid available and I think that they want you to call first there this is on our website so I think if you if you would look at the website that would would be helpful um, Gaunt Park pool will be opening Saturday May 28th which is the weekend of Memorial Day um, Opening day, okay, and now it will be open between one and seven. Um, and pool passes are currently being sold um, here at the Bryan Center, um, Bryan Youth Center, from noon, um, starting at noon today until seven o'clock um, on the twenty seventh. Is that uh, Monday through Friday, noon to seven, okay. Monday through Friday, and once the pool opens, they'll be sold at the pool at the only during uh, the hours that the pool is open. So once the pool's open, we will not be selling passes to here. Okay. And um, the rates have not changed this year. Um, so, and there is uh, swimming for all, which means that there's an income-based uh, rate structure. If you have any questions, talk to Ruth Ann Willick here at the uh, village offices. I do have a couple of other questions or announcements. Uh, first of all, um, we did put out on our Facebook page as well as um, on the website to please conserve water for the next couple of days because of some work that we're doing with the clear well at the plant. Um, I did just get an update from Brad and they're getting ready to fill that up again, but we still have to have that 24-hour period to do the test before we can start pushing that water <coughs> out again. So please conserve water until at least Wednesday morning and then check on the village website and the Facebook page to make sure that um, everything's okay to go back to normal usage. And also we will be flushing hydrants uh, next week. So Monday, uh, you can expect brown water to start. We'll do our normal start on the south side of town and work our way north. Um, so just be please prepared to experience brown water next week. And when is the, uh, the the large item pickup? I see May, a lot of people asking about that. It's next week, the week of oh, May 9th. May 9th, okay. okay. So people can put things out anytime starting May 9th. I mean, the preference would be that it would be on their own day. Is that typically when we ask them? Okay. Um, please put it out on your regular pickup day. Please do not put it out on a different day. Have it out there before your regular pickup comes. Thank you. Uh, Judith and Marianne, announcements? Okay, um, move on to the consent agenda. Uh, we have uh, just the minutes of April 18th, uh, regular meeting. I will entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, and then the petitions and communications, there weren't a lot. Oh, just a minute. Okay. Agenda review. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, review of the agenda, Marianne had mentioned before the meeting that she, she has a brief report on mowing uh, from the Environmental Commission, so we'll add that to old business. Mm -hmm. I, and I also have a, uh, something that I'd like to get on the agenda, probably for a future agenda, mm -hmm. but uh, I just wanted to uh, bring it up <coughs> at this point, which is in regard to the village starting to allow people to either round up on their utilities or make a donation. Okay. And uh, I know Melissa has done some research on it, 
and I thought it would be good to bring it to council before getting everything worked out to sort of look at the pros and cons of it. Okay. So I guess, I guess what was the purpose of it? To uh, provide some funds for low income people to help with the utility costs. Okay. So do you want to, to talk about it a little bit more tonight or just put it on the future? I, I thought we were going to talk a little bit about it before it was discussed in okay. the meeting. So I prefer that if we okay. could. Okay. Anything from you, Judith? Nope. Okay. So petitions and communications, there wasn't a lot. Um, the You'll see the letter of support. Um, I was requested by Brittany, um, Brittany Slett Parsons to write a letter of support oh. for um, some uh, rental housing that Home Inc. is uh, hoping to uh, undertake in the near future. Um, this is for some funding. Um, and at this point, the letter is in the packet. I would just ask for your approval to sign that letter and send it. I'll take a motion. I move that we approve the letter of support for Home Inc. to the okay. finance fund. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, Patty's already mentioned the hydrant flushing and um, the National Air Quality Awareness Week. Is it this week, Judy? I'm going to look at it. I'm embarrassed to say. No. Um, I don't think, and it wasn't in the. It, it, it was on in the online packet. You will check for us. And that's the one we're supporting. It's from MBRPC. Yeah, it is the week of May 2nd to okay. the 6th, yes. Okay. Do you want to address the Mills Law? Uh, let's, let's um, I know that it was being talked about. I want to be really careful about um, just adding things to the agenda that were up, are on our table. So I think what, I, what we'll do is just um, turn that over to, on our table was a letter from um, Owen Gustafson, uh, sixth grader, and Mia Campbell, a third grader, mm -hmm. at uh, Mills Lawn, uh, related to the sidewalk work that's ongoing. I know that uh, that staff has seen this, and I think that um, I don't know if they'll address it tonight, but I think it will be addressed. With yeah, I, I I'm going to speak with Jason about perhaps getting attention with that ramp in while we're here. Okay, terrific. So, um, so it's being addressed. It was a request for a, a ramp, a accessible ramp on the east well, east side of Walnut Street across from Mills Lawn um, because there isn't one now. There is one in front on the on the Mills Lawn side, but there isn't one directly across the street. So I think that the that the issue of these uh, both of these students um, do have power wheelchairs and they were requesting that. And I think it's probably something that, that we're gonna look into accommodating. Thank you. Um, so then the next thing is uh, public hearings and legislation. We have one uh, piece of legislation tonight, Ordinance 2016-09. Judy, you can just read it in by title only. All right. This is approving the form and authorizing the execution of Brown County Landfill Energy Schedule with American Municipal Power Incorporated. Okay. Um, can I get a motion, please? I so move. Second. Uh, Patty, would you explain uh, this one? Yes, um, although I was not here at the last <coughs> meeting, it is, it is my understanding that the um, <coughs> Energy Board, uh, through Judith, made a recommendation to Council to purchase uh, an interest in a new landfill gas generation site in Brown County, Ohio. Um, this is offered by Energy Development Incorporated through AMP um, to AMP members. We already have some landfill gas is part of our renewable energy portfolio and this just adds to our renewable energy. Um, so the board recommended along with staff uh, that we purchase some, an interest in that project and this ordinance is the first step in doing that. Um, is it, it's my understanding that are we losing that landfill gas that we have now or is that, is that, Okay. No, okay. Our, our contract on the current landfill gas runs through the end of 2021, and depending on how much generation they're getting from it at that point, we will likely renew those contracts. Mm -hmm. um, Judith, anything you want to report from the or from well, the energy board? Uh, well, the energy <coughs> board, you know, we full support of this. It adds to our renewable energy uh, portfolio, and um, yeah, I think it's great. 
personally, mm -hmm. I also very much in support. Right. And um, so, as far as the as far as what we're paying, is it equal to what the, the costs are? What we buy off the grid right now is is slightly lower than that, but um, you have to understand that you buy like three years in advance, mm -hmm. and um, what we buy off the grid is going up slightly in price, and by the time this actually kicks in and becomes part of, part of the portfolio, we expect this price to be slightly lower than buying off the grid, plus the fact that it's renewable. And what is the term of the contract? So um, 32, yeah. 25 years? 25 years, years which is pretty standard. standard. Okay. Just to say too, John Courtney had also felt uh, that we might start out, it may cost a little bit more, that in the long run, it'll be a stable price, mm -hmm. and in the long run, it'll be, you know, financially uh, right. well. well and I assume land I assume landfill gas is one of those things that decreases in price because it's just the startup costs right and it's also because it's consistent it's a 24 7 production I mean it stays it's, it's steady production and so the cost remains steady yes right. that's, that's one of the big benefits of it um, this is an ordinance we will have a second reading is there um, are there any comments from citizens Seeing and hearing that, I'll bring it back to the table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes, no plan. Yes. No plan? Yes. Oh, I'm I just realized that I had a question. Oh, go ahead. Can I say? Um, so I was reading, I actually read. Okay. You read? <laughs> I actually read the documents, yeah. And I, and I, it seemed as, I wasn't clear from reading them whether we were selling our wrecks or not. Because I thought we we are trying we want to keep our wrecks. Um, that was um, part of the. It was made clear to Ann that we want to keep our wrecks. And and I'll be honest with you, this was we were in such a state trying to get this ordinance together um, that I will review it uh, very closely and make sure that's the case because we can always change that at the next meeting. Mm -hmm. the final yeah. Um, because this did come from Ann. It says, like on page four of the contract, uh, second paragraph, AMP shall sell the environmental credits and provide a payment or credit to the municipality. But but I wasn't totally clear when I read it if that. If it, right, you have you have the right to either keep your recs or or allow AMP to sell them to offset the cost of the project. And we told them that we wanted to keep our recs. So, yeah, I and, and it does say in the event that the municipality desires to keep those, et cetera, it, it, it completes out that paragraph. It looks as if you have that choice either uh -huh. way. Correct. Yeah. So just make sure that that's. And, and the reason for that, could you explain why we want to keep our wrecks? We want to keep our wrecks because it's the, um, they're called the renewable energy credits. And it, it's what technically makes your portfolio green. But not only does it do that, but it allows you to have um, a certain bonus when you're applying for grants for renewable energy and, and for things like our solar field. Um, at the end of the day, when we choose to move forward and potentially purchase the solar array that we're getting ready to construct, the renewable energy credits will work in our favor when we go to get the funding for that. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions? Judy, now you can call the roll. Okie doke. McQueen? Yes. Hamlin? Yes. Winthrop? Yes. Okay. And we will have a second reading at uh, the next week May meeting. Uh, citizens' concerns. Now is the time in the agenda where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Uh, you have three minutes. We ask that you come to the podium and uh, state your name. <clears throat> Liz Porter, um, and I've written it out so I don't forget anything. Um, I and others have recently written letters regarding alley upkeep and maintenance, so I won't repeat uh, what has already been said, um, except that alleys are valuable infrastructure, both for individuals and for the community at large, and necessary for utility line maintenance and emergency vehicles. The village does plow our alley after heavy snows, and that has been appreciated and necessary. In particular, our alley um, is probably the most heavily used alley in the village as St. Paul's Church abuts it, as well as at least six well-used garages. I'd like to speak to the conflicting administrative attitudes that I've noticed that have evolved over the years, um, which is why I've raised my questions. I've uh, owned my home on South Stafford for over 20 years, 
In the first few years, I received a notice from the village, which was given to our entire neighborhood, reminding us to trim our alleyway vegetation. The notice stated that if the vegetation wasn't trimmed in a certain length of time, the village would trim it and we might be assessed a fee. Since that time, however, I've called several times regarding vegetation and the village has just come in and trimmed it back without notifying the neighborhood. I don't know that anyone has objected to this. I've certainly appreciated it. Property owners or renters who do not use the alley tend to be neglectful of how their vegetation or even refuse impacts those who do. When pot potholes have become problematic, I've also called a few times and historically, the response of the village was to come through and grade the alley a bit and fill the potholes. However, when I called the village manager's office a few years ago, my request was noted, but nothing happened. When I called again several weeks or a month later, I was told uh, by the village manager that alleys are technically unimproved roadways and that the village does not have to maintain them in a smooth condition. I was surprised and disappointed, but let it go. Um, soon after that, a few of the worst potholes near Limestone Street were filled in by the village, but most of the alley was still pretty rough. I considered myself to be formally rebuffed and have not called since then. However, the condition of the roadbed has gotten so much worse, I wish, to, I wish the council to explore and clarify the village's attitude or policy toward the issue. Although I'm certainly no expert, I doubt that it would require much in the way of expense or time for the village to do routine maintenance of the alleyways. Bringing attention to residents regarding their responsibilities uh, could be added to utility bills biannually in the fall and spring, for instance and then the village crews could come through and trim as needed. I am guessing that the pothole problem probably only applies to a few alleys and once generally remediated wouldn't require much maintenance. Additionally, I believe that the green alleys, which have little vehicle traffic, should especially be proactively dealt with because the residents in those situations have no incentive to keep their vegetation trimmed unless they are mandated or lose the right to trim their own vegetation. If the village response is solely reactive, who would place those calls requesting attention? Would it be acceptable for walkers who do not live in the respective neighborhoods to call the village? So that's one question. Thanks for your consideration. Our alleys are necessary, useful, increased property values, enhance walkability, and last but not least, are quite lovely. Thank you. Thanks, do you, do you want a copy of this, or um, is that good enough? No, I, I think it would be good. I wouldn't mind. I would like to have a copy, because I think there's, there's a lot of detail in there. Thank you. No, I'll just give that to Judy. Yeah, Thank you. And you don't need to do this. Oh, you have multiple copies. You don't need to do make the copies tonight, Judy. But. Can I continue? Yeah, go ahead. My name is Anna Maria Eberhardt. I am living in 329 South Stafford Street with my family. I am requesting the council that the council considers the role of the village with regard to the maintenance and upkeep of the village alleys. And in particular, with regards to the current poor status of our alley, which is between South Stafford and Phillips Street. And when we, when my husband and I moved to Yellow Springs in 2014, actually, we thought that grading and maintenance of the alleys were the responsibility of the village. Lately, we've learned that this may not be the case. So we would like to request that the council consider the role of the village on, on this matter. And please take the following arguments into account. First of all, the village owns the alleys. Of course, we and our neighbors use the alley daily to get out and back to our garages and carports. But we are not the only ones. We see a lot of people using our alley for walking, strolling, children play there, bikers use it. In particular, alleys such as ours which are close to the village center provide safe and quiet access for pedestrians and bikers to shops and events. Our alley is also used by vehicles from St. Paul's Church. In addition to this, the alley is also used for infra infrastructure maintenance to take care of the village electricity network in our neighborhood. Our alley has been in poor condition with large potholes since we moved to Yellow Springs in 2014. Over the past winter, the deterioration of the alley has accelerated so that the potholes have now become a hazard for bikers and pedestrians. And even cars take to driving on the roadside vegetation, so evade the holes and causing further damage. The village is improved by having well-kept, if not beautiful alleys. 
they definitely add up to the specific widely known and attractive charm of Yellow Springs. So thank you for the presentation. Welcome to Yellow Springs. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, had, I had intended to just have Patty address that during her report since if we have a short meeting, I let's just go ahead and see. I mean, why don't you see right, what you yeah. found? Um, when I came back from vacation, I was um, I was told that there had been these um, these letters that had come in, and, and I asked Judy to forward them to me so that I could read them. And I did talk to Jason about it, Jason Handy, and um, this is what Jason told me. It was exactly what you said used to be the policy. Um, he says that still is that if we get a call. Um, about vegetation or about potholes, we will go out and um, we'll send a letter to the property owner because what you have to understand is that our crew are not landscapers. When they go in and cut something, they're just going to cut it and it's not going to look <coughs> nice and pretty, it's just going to look like a cut bush. And so we try to give the property owner the opportunity to cut it themselves first and then if they don't, we'll go through and cut it or we'll fill the potholes or something. But it does tend to be more of a reactive response as opposed to a proactive response, which means if you call us, we'll come out, we'll take care of it, but it's it's not something we're going to consistently look at. So it's going to fall through the cracks. We might catch it, you might catch it. It's always better if you call and say, hey, we have this big pothole, or hey, we have this bush that's really sticking out, or send me an email or something like that, and, and then we will take care of it. And that has always, Jason tells me that has been and continues to be the way that he approaches that. So I, I think you said that you stopped calling, and my thought was, well, maybe the person who normally called moved or something, but apparently you just stopped calling because you thought it was no longer the policy. I did. Yeah. Yeah. But it is. So um, that's the first thing that I want to say. Um, we will try to keep a better eye on it and, and to, to look a little more closely at it, but it does tend to be more reactive than proactive. So please, feel free to call my office, email me, just get it to me in some form and, and I'll pass it on to Jason and then I'll keep track of it. Um, as far as the, um, you can email them a little bit earlier um, this evening about the, or the parking at the church and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And I, I will ask the chief to look at that. He's out, of, he's off this week, he's out of town. Um, and we'll look at that and see. Um, the request that she had this afternoon was during, you know, the, the parking on, um, during mass at St. Paul's tends to get a little bit congested down there. And perhaps it's something we need to revisit about. While the cars are currently legally parked, is there something that we should be doing a little bit differently to make it a little bit safer? So we'll look into that. Thanks. You know, as far as I don't want to get into a big discussion about the alleys, but the only thing I would say is, you know, maybe if we could have just as we've we've kind of decided to prioritize the sidewalks to say which are the most heavily traveled. You know, there are certainly commercial um, alleys. The alley behind. Exactly. Uh, well, Pete's Alley, obviously, the one, but the, but the one that's, <clears throat> excuse me, behind um, Earl Publishing. Mm -hmm. That's a busy one, and I noticed. So maybe if we could, if we could start to uh, pay attention. Obviously, clearly, this one is a very heavily used. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I have mixed feelings about about potholes because I know how um, annoying it is. But and I live on Cemetery Street, or not Cemetery Street, but but Railroad Street, and I can guarantee you how annoying those potholes are. But my husband and I also know that it really keeps traffic slow. slow. And we had a guy go down our street at about probably 50 miles an hour yesterday, and I could not believe it. And you know, I immediately said, I don't, you know, let's leave all the potholes there. I don't care. Um, because it was, you know, that would be, now I'm not saying your alley is not that situation. An alley is certainly not that situation, although it could be scary because of kids playing. Um, I mean, I know that's where I played when I was a kid in my old neighborhood, so. Um, but I, you know, I do think ones that are used heavily should be, um, you know, the vegetation issue is, a, is an issue Sidewalks everywhere, outdoors. and that's just something we really have to encourage citizens just to pay attention to their property and to take care of what they need to on their properties. So I, I, I like the idea of for property owners along those alleys of sending out a notice. Right. That's having what, them do the vegetation. Right. That's what we do with, with sidewalk vegetation. Um, if, if someone has a complaint about 
vegetation encroaching on the sidewalk. Um, generally, Denise will first send them out an email that says your vegetation is encroaching on the sidewalk and you need to cut it back and you have until such and such a date. And then if they don't do it by that date, then the crew schedules it and goes out and takes care of it. Well, can something just be stuck in like the utility bills? Or uh, I, I'm sure Melissa can put it when there's not another message. Mm -hmm. We can put it, make it, you know, a regular thing to stick it on there occasionally. Mm -hmm. but I wondered if we could, um, because there's some green alleyways that are quite beautiful, but they're really getting so overgrown you can hardly walk down them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not being driven on, but they're, and they're just, I'm afraid they're going to get full of briars and things where people literally, it's going to become very difficult to really make them passable. I was wondering if maybe in the spring and fall, um, somebody could, <coughs> if there's time, uh, hand out, you know, just put little notices in, because there's not that many alleyways, you know, in the homes that are abutting them in the door, you know, from the village, so it's kind of official looking, so it is official, um, at say, you know, in the spring and the fall, you know, we would like you to be, because some of them haven't been trimmed in years. I mean, there's one uh, limestone between High Street and Lawson Place, I guess it would be, uh, which um, it would be beautiful, but it's not being mowed, it's not being trimmed, and it's getting, it's getting very overgrown. And with, it's just a, a nice walkway that, we go, that goes like to the edge of the AME uh, church parking lot, for example. And um, I think people, you know, probably don't realize there's, you know, they maybe should be doing something relative to that. But I think if only one person does it, you know, it's still not going to be passable. So I, anyway, it was a thought that we could maybe be doing that yeah. in the spring and the fall. Yeah. Well, know, mowing is an issue. That the mowing is a, this kind of a different issue because, you know, that's a lot more work. You know, that that's certainly different than... Well, if you're mowing your lawn and you think and you that just you know that's your responsibility, right. it's really not that much, right. but it's just, I don't know, that there, <laughs> there seems to be some alleyways where people aren't, uh, you know, people don't even know that they're alleyways at this point. Well, yes, they, they, know know that that they may not know they're alleyways, yeah. they may think the villa, it's the village's responsibility to maintain yeah. them, and really what we own is a right of way. I mean, when, when you talk about utility easements and, and things like that, that's, that's only a right of way. It's not actually owning the property. So it could be that we own the alley. It could be that the property owners own the alley. It just depends on the situation. So, um, but I think that we could probably come up with a system to notify adjacent property owners. I mean, it's like cutting the tree lawn in front of your home between the sidewalk and the curb. Technically, that's a right of way, but I own mine. So I cut it, um, and perhaps if we. I was just saying, if we tell people, because right. people haven't been in the habit of thinking of it. Right, it's not something that occurs to them. So. Can people. I just say one more? Sh sure. Just, one. just that it, you know, I it started because I was interested in my alley, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but just I think the alleys are such a treasure, mm -hmm. and and I really think those little greenways are completely neglected, and they're just they're really. Wonderful. I, if we're, I, I'm a dog lover, so and my, you know, walk all over town or used to when she was alive. Um, but um, they're just beautiful, and I do think that if it's reactive, it, would it be okay, for instance, for a walker to call and say such and such alley is almost impassable? Absolutely. Oh, would that's that be okay? In, absolutely. It's the same thing with sidewalks, certainly, okay. and that's how we get notified okay. mostly of the all sidewalks. Right. It's yeah. not a neighbor. It's. Right. So I mean, I understand. You know, you can only stretch manpower so far, but. Um, it, it's it's an asset to everybody. That's oh, absolutely yeah. yes. If you if that if you see something like that, please please okay. call or email. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Uh, any other citizens' concerns? Okay, we'll come back to the agenda. Um, old business. Um, first item on the agenda is potential sale of a portion of Sutton Farm to Glen Helen. Um, and let's see. I think we will just we have some information in the packet. I think one of the things that uh, we asked about at the last meeting was to have somewhat of a timeline as, to, as far as, as our response um, and how we how quickly we needed to act. I see that uh, that Nick is here. Um, and this timeline came from Nick. Oh, okay, good. And, and um, at the last meeting, we did have the appraisal. I'm trying to remember if we had dis if we discussed the appraisal. I guess we didn't have the appraisal at the last meeting. I think that was something we discussed in um, executive session, right? Correct. Okay. 
So I'll turn it over to Patty to you know discuss the appraisal and where things stand right now. Um, I'll be honest with you, I left it sitting on my desk. <laughs> um, but um, thank you very much. Um, the total on the appraisal was 300, 300,000. Um, this came into Melissa while I was on vacation, and it was um, it was a three hundred thousand dollar appraisal. Which um, initially we thought, mm, is that right? But then Melissa did some checking and compared it to current market prices, and it is a very fair appraisal of the property. Um, and then, if, did I include Nick's? I guess I didn't include Nick's summary of the price because you had sent an additional email, Nick, about. Um, what would be included in the cost of the survey and the, um, the um, transfer of the land and all of that. So would you please briefly go over sure, that? Sure, I did, and I'm loath to say I left one small item off of that. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, in, in terms of the overall project costs, is this a document that's been shared with the council? Um, the, um, are you talking about the, the budget? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I sent that to, did I not send that to the packet? Okay. Sorry, I'm still trying to get my feet back. <laughs> um, so apparently no. Okay, um, well, uh, in narrow terms, the uh, appraisal, the, the, the fee for the appraisal, something that's covered uh, within uh, Clean Ohio uh, project. Uh, we'd also need a, a survey for the property. There's an estimated amount. Uh, for a survey in there, that, that amount could vary as we dive into it. Um, title work and closing costs are uh, a necessary part of any, any acquisition. And it may be that the village has uh, internal resources that, that would allow uh, some of those to come come off the budget, but they're, they're on there for now. Um, uh, we included site improvements, by which I mean honeysuckle removal. That's, first of all, something with the uh, the property needs, and second of all, including that in the budget, uh, improves the standing of the application in the eyes of Clean Ohio. Uh, and then the item that I didn't include is a baseline documentation for the Tecumseh Land Trust. When uh, when the village put a uh, an easement on the property, accepted the easement on the property a number of years ago, apparently this was the first easement that, that the Tecumseh Land Trust uh, uh, placed on any property, and they've They've learned a lot since then, uh, so uh, this is this is an opportunity to go back and put in a thorough uh, a baseline that they'll be able to use for, for future monitoring of the property, something that they didn't have uh, in, in the past. Looking at all of that, it, it leads to a, what I estimate as a total uh, project cost of $358,000. Uh, and, and I'll remind uh, council that uh, um, uh, Clean Ohio uh, could conceivably absorb 75% of that. Uh, at the end of the day, then, we'd be looking at uh, hopefully the village uh, being able to clear uh, $205,500 uh, for, for the acquisition of the, uh, of the property. That, um, that number uh, could vary depending on the question of uh, closing costs. Uh, and it could vary depending on on whether uh, uh, the village deemed it necessary or important to uh, uh, put a, a fence on the property perimeter. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding was that we would receive three quarters of the value. Is that three quarters of the project value? So um, we end up with a project of three fifty eight which leads to a, um, uh, a grant of potentially 268000 uh, And then from that, we'd still have to pay the, um, the surveyor, the appraiser, uh, uh, the um, uh, folks doing honeysuckle removal, um, uh, to come to land trust for, for their components. And, and what's left from that is the 205500 so then we're um, donating hundred thousand, essentially, yeah, ninety-four five. If you assume yeah. the land is three hundred, it's ninety-four five. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. 
Um, let's see what we need to do. And how and how does all of the paperwork? I mean, do they will they write us a check? Who writes us a check? Uh, so at, at closing, um, uh, there would be a check to to the village for for that amount. From Clean from, Ohio or from from, from, from the Ohio Ohio. Public Works Commission. Okay. And, and we will somehow get documentation of our, what's essentially, I would consider a donation of that 70, that 25%? That, that's correct. The appraisal is, is the documentation okay. of that. And, uh, and it may be that, that Clean Ohio would require a, 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 an audit of the appraisal to verify that, that value. Okay. Um, any other questions, concerns? Chris, did you have anything you wanted to add? Not at this time, no. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I am a little taken back because I thought that if we would get three quarters of the value of the property, which is not the case. Um, so it's a difference of about 20. And what was the appraisal again? 300,000. Maybe two twenty-five, so it's where it's off by twenty thousand. I just want to say I still think it's a, a good. A, uh, it's certainly I certainly still support the our um, going forward with this agreement. I think it's a good investment. Of, you know, a good uh, way for that land to be protected in a kind of new way, and, uh, and then we get some benefit, financial benefit as well. Um, since we, we did not see the, the budget, um, I'd like to know what there are all the closing costs and all the legal stuff. Sure. So that's one lump. Right. And then there's the work that you're the restoration. Work. Sure. Now, um, well, you have it with you. Yeah. 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 Problem, my only problem talk. is I can't read from it and, <laughs> and talk about it at the same time. Um, uh, but so mostly, I just want to know what the cost of the restoration is. Sure. And then the rest has it's, uh, sure. It, we budgeted forty-six thousand uh, dollars for it, which uh, is based on uh, thirty-one acres uh, of restoration at the rate of fifteen hundred dollars per acre. Um, so, just to put that in comparison's sake, it's it's quite a bit less per acre than than the project right out right out back here, uh, which was about a I'm going to be guessing, but about a seventy thousand dollar restoration for about 12 acres um, so put put that way I, I think we're coming in with a fairly conservative uh, um, amount of what it will take and, um, I, I realized that I, I probably could have um, been more clear about the, the relationship between what clean Ohio could bring and what the village could um, could stand to uh, uh, to recoup at the end of the process uh, um, but I, I, I will say that I was um, I was pleased by this number because I had in my head the, the 150,000 uh, that, that, that we discussed at, at, uh, earlier. Uh, <coughs> is, is there is there a possibility that and I know that pro that Clean Ohio can't guarantee because they their deal is 75 percent of the project cost. Is there a possibility that that Glen Helen Association could could guarantee us a minimum amount so so that if some of these costs went over expectation that we wouldn't be getting less than say two hundred and five thousand. Um, the um, president of the Black Hall Association is here and, and, and can speak. <coughs> um, I, I I will I will say from my perspective I can I think it would be helpful for the the council to, to think about what what the village needs for this property in order to make it um, make sense. But I, I will I will share the the perspective of you know if funds are coming from the Glen Helen Association, they're funds that are are cash dollars raised yeah. raised by uh, by donors that, that could be put to other things. Whereas this is. Um, funds that we are going out and um, seeking from public sources to, to bring to the village. Okay. 
Um, Patty, have we done, have we gotten an estimate on a fence? Where does staff stand on feeling that we need a fence and have we gotten an estimate um, on Um, I was the one who felt we needed a fence and staff disagrees with me. Okay. So, um, I guess we don't need a fence. <clears throat> okay. So is the restoration just removing honeysuckle? That's that's the restoration in the, the near term. Longer term, once the grant is done, uh, there'll be more work to do uh, in terms of restoration planting. Um, but, uh, but the grant basically allows us two years, uh, and we don't think we can do everything in two years. Uh, so we'll, this grant includes basically what we think we can get done in two years. Any other comments or questions? So, okay, so let's look at this timeline again. So, what physically, what do we need to give to Nick, Chris, or Patty? Do we need to have legislation? What do we need to do? He's probably going to need something to include with his grant that says that should he receive that grant, we're willing to sell him the property. Um, whether that be legislation or just a letter from us signed by either myself or you as the, as the council president. Um, I don't know that it needs to be legislation at this point, does it, Nick? Or do you, would um, you prefer that just for? By, by the time, I guess there's two pieces to it. Uh, in, in the near term, uh, some sort of, of commitment that gives us the confidence that we should proceed with the work of, of preparing an application uh, would be very helpful. Uh, uh, by the uh, July 1st uh, submission deadline, we would be needing to include uh, either uh, you know, a, an option agreement that, that says essentially uh, that the village commits to um, uh, sell the property to the Glen Helen Association uh, pending successful uh, funding of, of our, our proposal with the, the Clean Ohio Conservation Fund. Yeah. You would prepare that? I could draft something, but you'd probably want to have what, your people seems, look at it. Well, we would, but it seems to me that, we, that you have to just look at this as any real estate transaction. There needs to be an offer and an acceptance and a contract that says we'll sell it, and then there would be a legislation that would be approved by council to authorize the manager to act and close the transaction. What's different about this is that since we're dealing with a grant entity for the Glen, we, it just makes it a little bit different than a, a traditional land sale. But to me, that's what all this is. That's what this is. So, so is it a resolution or an ordinance, or can we just make a motion tonight that we're going? Yeah, you have always in the past, for example, with the homing Glen and things of that nature, just it's easier to find when you go back through the record to look for what did council do and why did they do it. it, it it's very easy to attach to minutes and a resolution. So, uh, as for, for the public record standpoint, I, I, I love it to be a resolution. That's why I would suggest we have a resolution for the, at the next meeting. Um, well, then it's spelling this out. I mean, it, with this, with the, with this estimate attached, budget worksheet attached. If. Um, well, would you also want the option contract in that? Anything that we can have by then. Because normally when we pass a resolution on a contract, it's got the, the contract attached. I mean, my feeling is that anything we can have and should have to make the decision, we should have. So Nick, if you could draft the, the agreement, um, the option to purchase, and then um, uh, we can take care of the resolution, and we have the timeline and the budget, and we can put those with them. Happy. And let's just have a general, you said you, your support of general consensus among the three of us is that we're supportive of continuing, knowing, seeing this new number, we're supportive of continuing. Yeah, and I have another question. Okay, good. Um, so you said that this was maybe the first easement that to come to the land trust. That, that's so, my understanding. And so, um, and Will their relationship to the property change now? And are they uh, co-doing uh, the grant with you, or are no, you doing it? They are not co-doing the grant. That, that'll be a Glen Helm Association grant. Their, their relationship to the property is, is informed by, by the, the two items that you see on the, 
on the budget. They will they will do an updated um, um, baseline documentation uh, and and build in the, the stewardship fee that will ena enable them to evaluate our progress doing site restoration based on what they've seen from the baseline documentation. Uh, Does that mean that they, they will come in once a year? Exactly. And previously? Well, pre the, the, they were doing that, but they didn't have anything that they were comparing it to. Mm -hmm. So they were doing it and they were saying, all right, well, you got 31 acres of honeysuckle and 45 acres of, of ag, check. So let's see if we can try to get a, uh, let's see, we have the appraisal done. Maybe we can get a survey and some title work done, donated. I don't know, maybe that's how we could work together on this one to say to reduce the project costs. Um, anyway, so we'll, so it sounds like we've got a plan. The plan is that information will be coming back to the May 16th meeting. Is it May 16th? Yeah. May 16th meeting uh, for a resolution. We just wanted to see, keep seeing you coming to meetings. Always a pleasure. <laughs> uh, and uh, Marianne, I didn't, I didn't fully answer uh, your question. You may have also been asking about the, the status of the conservation easement. So everything that was in the initial Tecumseh Land Trust easement uh, runs with the land, so that stands and will still be a part of, of any restrictions that, that we'll have to work with in the future. Um, but the land will also have on top of that a Clean Ohio Conservation Fund yeah. easement. Uh, so, so both of those things will, will govern future management of the property. Okay. Uh, and let's move this uh, this bottom agenda item um, status report on one annexation. Let's move that up. Nick could leave if he would like. Um, who has a report on that? You, you want to start batting, or do you want me? To well. Um, Judy, Chris, and I met today to discuss the timeline um, and to go over what the next steps are. Um, it, was, it, it was a little confusing <coughs> at first, but um, essentially what we came up with, uh, Chris has, has drafted the, um, the necessary paperwork for um, Andy Atkins to sign. Judy is going to take that to Andy along with the Mylars that Chris is going to bring her next week. Um, and uh, we will start the process of these various filings that have to be done in a timely manner. Um, I did ask Chris to come up with a timeline and put dates on it so that I don't miss any of the dates because if you miss one, you have to start over and we certainly don't want to do that. Um, so that's where we stand as far as um, the timeline and, and we kind of divvied up the duties today as to what I have to do and what Judy has to do and what Chris has to do. So. I, yeah, so I, I, mean, I, I think that fundamentally, that the, we've got to coordinate with, with, as you know, with the county, the township, and with council. And once we, when the petition is filed, and uh, Judy will get the signature, we file it. Then we've got a 20-day timeline, five days to get out notices to all the uh, adjacent property owners. Uh, then we have to serve the fiscal officer for the township along with the clerk of the uh, county commission and then of course Patty has to sue, uh, serve Judy <laughs> as part of this process. Uh, then we have to verify that we've done all of those steps and then we have to uh, appear before the county commission at their first meeting following the, the filing of the petition, let them know that we're here, what's happening, and then we have to pass a series of legislation uh, by resolution uh, that includes uh, the services agreement, what services we intend to offer once the, we accept uh, the land, uh, and in this case, essentially fire, not fire, pardon me, uh, water and police. Um, and then we have to uh, make steps to change the zoning uh, to make sure that's consistent with what we need it to be. And, and so it's not, it, it, it's complicated only because the process itself is complicated and, and getting the paperwork together. Because there's about 15 different forms that we have to draft and get done. So yeah. uh, just yeah. wanted to make sure that we get it all done right, right before we start is right. really what we're doing here, making sure that people know what role they're responsible for filling. Yeah, I believe that, that we had intended, we had thought that there was going to be legislation on this agenda, and we were, or on this, for this meeting, and, and 
that clearly we weren't ready for that. So as long as the three people, right. that there are three people that know what's going on and you bring something to us and we vote on it, then we're... Right, we just, yeah, we have <laughs> three people who know what's going on. We have, <laughs> yeah, we don't. Well, we, we just, did, we we just, just know too, but I think Nick just got his update today, but I'll go okay. with that yeah. too. You know, we just want to make sure that we we're ready to go with with everything because once you start the process you don't want to miss a step okay so we want to have you know once judy files um once she gets andy to sign the the um the application and she takes them down and files them with the county then i only have a certain period of time to serve the county judy and the township and then i have a certain period of time to get the notices out and so I want to make sure that we have everything where it needs to be. And I don't want to miss one of those. Right, and clearly you're you're coordinating them with those with council meetings mm -hmm. um, for our for our. Yes, I, I asked Judy to please make sure that she didn't serve anything the day after a council meeting. Yeah, you know, file the day after a council meeting because that would my whole schedule. She promised me she would. Okay. So. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Nick. Uh, <clears throat> next is a discussion regarding use of funds from the sale of village-owned property, since we're not talking about that. Now, maybe if we sell some village-owned property, we'll have some money. <laughs> so we know, actually, we're, we do have a uh, sale for uh, the remaining two lots at Cemetery Street pending. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that council action is required on that. No, um, actually it's not. Um, they were already, the sales were already approved in the original legislation. I, I, I did just get an email update. Um, that closing was scheduled for tomorrow. Now it's been postponed to Thursday because of a, because of a scheduling conflict that came up. But um, the papers are all signed except for the actual closing documents I've signed. The, the warranty deeds, which Chris had uh, actually has the originals over there. Um, to take back with him. Um, so if, and as far as I know, it will occur Thursday, either Thursday at 11 or Thursday at 1. So um, so that though, those two Cemetery Street lots were really the first pieces of real estate we had sold in a long time. Um, we did have an investment there in, in infrastructure. I don't believe we had any kind of a discussion at the time as to what, the, what those proceeds would be used for. You know, clearly it wasn't a huge amount of money. I think now that we're looking at a much greater sum of money from um, the sale of, uh, the potential sale of Sutton Farm, I think, you know, we're looking at, at a larger amount and what could that mean? Um, I mean, in my view, I think, I think we have to start with, you know, what funds bought the properties in the first place and what was the purpose of the purchase of the property. I, mean, I just think that that's probably something that should be known. You know, if it was purchased for green space, you know, maybe at least some of the funds should, should go back into green space. I think what had happened with the first two lots at, at, uh, at Cemetery Street is that, as Melissa said, I believe those just went into the general fund. So it went straight into the general fund. Um, once it's in the general fund, and I think it's fine even for these two lots that are gonna close on, on Cemetery Street, soon that that money can go into the general fund because we can always target it later um, but once it goes into something besides the general fund then it may be stuck there so you know i guess i, I see this as kind of the first discussion we're having about philosophically um, where we see um, you know where we see those funds being used um, and supplementing um, the general fund it's one-time money you know we always we always have been told don't you know you can't use it for operating funds. It really has to be used for, think about it as one-time project kind of kind of money um, instead of anything ongoing or anything that really has, has an impact on the general fund because it's typically not a lot of money. It's one-time money again. I was going to say, when we did this, when we made the case for the Cemetery Street, uh, you know, for uh, the project, the domain, it was, argue because I argued it <laughs> that that money would go to help the infrastructure improvements that would need to happen there that it wasn't in the legislation I'm, I'm you know that could be the case and evidently is the case but um, mm -hmm. but I, that was I think the intention mm -hmm. and I would be for doing that because um, that was part of like I said that was part of the justification I was on the other side of the mm -hmm. whatever right <laughs> But that, that was my me. understanding as well. That the well, it, and it, the infrastructure project was funded 
that some of that money probably came from, went into the water fund from the general fund. The water line versus C Street? C Street. I think the one was it straight out of us. Okay. And, and it's, chances are, if, if it was, even if it wasn't in the legislation, especially, I think Melissa is new. I don't think Melissa was here. So, so there's really no knowledge, continuing knowledge of that. Yeah. And the general yeah. fund is always the safest place. I mean, if council chooses to, I mean, you could yeah, still no, transfer that. It's um, totally fine. I understand why it happened, but I'm just right. I, I would agree with that, that in the situation, especially good. considering the fact that the water fund is is yeah, you know use. probably our lowest fund right now. Um, um, another, I mean, I, I think probably each property is unique in some way. So, so another thing would be to look at well, how was it being used? Well, it really wasn't except for parking, but um, it was part of this whole property so another thing might be say well could that whatever leftover money go into parks and recreation well and one of the things that that um, the crews have asked for and, and I, I support this is I, I don't know if you've been out to Sutton Farm in a while but the crew quarters are in pretty bad shape um, they you know if it rains really hard the water comes under the walls and um, it's really cold and drafty in there and so one thing that they have asked and, and I support them in is to ask council to consider using part of that to, to build some new crew quarters. Mm -hmm. And potentially what we could do is get a, a, a Clean Ohio grant to take down the old, um, the old house that's out there, the one that is filled with raccoons and asbestos, and, uh, and potentially build some new crew quarters there. And I have asked Jason and Johnny um, to work together on a design and getting a cost on that so that council will have a basis for you know, what that could potentially cost and what it would include. And, and it wouldn't be Cadillac, but it would at least be a place where they could eat their lunches without their coats on in the wintertime <laughs> and without getting wet uh, when it rains. And you're talking about the money from the Sutton Farm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of it, because yes. I, was, I was still talking about the Brian property that got sold. I mean, I, I make, I'm not disagreeing yeah. with you, just yeah. clarifying which property we're talking about. I make an argument with Cemetery Street because that was supposed to be, that really was supposed to be parking for the Northern Gateway mm -hmm. and that that maybe some of that money be invested back into some parking improvements um, mm -hmm. in the village because it's something we certainly could use. So I, don't, I mean, I think that there's all kinds of, all kinds of projects. I think, you know, we, I, my recollection was that we had talked at the, at the retreat about coming up with a list of village owned properties and right. part of that would be why do we own them why were they purchased in the first place and what funding was used so you know i i feel like that i mean you know there, i think we could go through all kinds of things i mean certainly i would see green space i mean with the sutton farm it seems that there should be some portion of that yeah. that, that that goes in to supplement the green space fund um uh, you know, I, and again, I think I, I think it depends upon what the property is and what what the original intent was. Um, and Jerry and I are working on that inventory. I, I came up with the inventory list and I sent it to Jerry, and unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to get together and move on that. But in in terms of the Sutton Farms, you know that some money might go to uh, crew quarters. I'm not opposed to that, but. I'm not sure I like the idea of putting it where that uh, where that current house is because it's a it's actually quite a big space space mm -hmm. and it seems like it could be if I think the original idea for the crew quarters was was in the I don't know what to call it the, the building ones the, 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 the closet mm -hmm. which because it seems like that uh, other you know once that house is down that that that's a Big enough piece of property that could actually be used for something else that could be, and that's sort of more, you know, it's sort of okay. more dense in terms of thinking in terms of increase and uh, more of a dense, mm -hmm. yeah. dense use of, right. the, of the land since we have limited right. land. That's um, certainly so that's a, so yeah. that's just a that's certainly situation. something we should think think about it. And I I will tell you that you know there was a concern that that well there was potentially con contaminated, but we tested that well last year, and that is perfectly for the water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I asked Joe Bates to test it before he left, and, and it's it's probable. Well, is there <laughs> anything wrong with the house? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, that the, the house needs to come down, and, and it does have asbestos in it. So 
the Clean Ohio grant may be a way to, to do that and take care of that. And actually, um, we're trying to get an estimate from a contractor um, just so we have a ballpark idea of that. Um, who says that he can potentially tent that thing and take it down with the asbestos in it and dispose of it properly. So. <coughs> My understanding is, in, in addition to the asbestos, there's mold. And that, and that the and moisture has gotten into the walls to the point where structurally it's, yes. the walls are, are unstable. So it's one of those that, that unfortunately it's probably gone too far and, and there's probably not um, a huge, it, you know, it's not a significant, I don't know that I would consider a significant structure to try to save um, historically. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the Sutton, farm monies, I mean, I definitely would like to see as much money of that money as possible go into the green space fund. I, I was talking to Krista a couple of weeks ago uh, about the, about it, just sort of wanting to get her input, and um, and she pointed out to me that, uh, you know, the, the green belt that we hope to preserve, you know, towards going towards Fairborn, um, that there's there's going to be a need for some funding, you know, potentially fairly near future if we want to really be able to preserve, um, you know, that green belt. So so um, so I think when we have an opportunity, we should try to get some more money. I mean, maybe so that that would be my what I would be for. Uh, yeah, and I think that's you know that that would be my thinking, and I think what I'd like to hear is is you know maybe um, a more developed proposal from staff on um, what what their plans are for crew quarters and the amount of money that would take, um, and then you know start to look at the money the amount of money left, and um, if it all sh if there all the remainder should go to the green space fund, or if there are some other alternatives potentially. Anything else on that subject right now? Okay. Uh, municipal fiber work session. Um, excuse me. One, one oh, sorry, sure. um, I appreciate that conversation on, on allocation of funds. <clears throat> uh, and I'll state as a as a citizen of town that I I agree with the sense that it'd be great to put as much uh, money from property sold has green space into into a green space fund because there will there will be properties whether they're uh, ones uh, that are proximate to the village well field or or that uh, help us complete our, our um, village uh, planning process where um, uh, matching funds for for outside sources like clean ohio are going to be the things that enable those easements or acquisitions to move forward. So I just appreciate the, the council's um, uh, wrangling, uh, uh, wrestling with this issue and, and uh, uh, want to encourage that. I prefer wrangling over wrestling. <laughs> 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 um, that did make me think of something though, is, is the things we've taken on with the, this hillside out here and with the um, with Glass Farm, this idea, you know, maybe we have grants that will take us for a few years, but we do have to start looking um, beyond those few years for ongoing maintenance. And I'm also thinking, I keep I keep thinking that there has to be a, be a way for us to, um, to better um, engage or encourage um, citizen investment, and I really do think for something like that, we should um, engage the um, community foundation to set up some kind of a matching fund, some kind of a fund for ongoing green space maintenance. I don't know what it would be called, that, that citizens could leave endowments to, that citizens could make donations to. We've got similar to what we did with this property out here where, where Glen Helen is going to be actually um, maintaining that property for us as part of that, that grand agreement. That was something that we had discussed mm -hmm. during that process because staff will be limited as to what, as what they can do. And so we set that up. Great. Good discussion. Thanks, everybody. So the, um, uh, the final workshop I had, a, I kind of tried to condense and um, put things together that seem to make sense to go together with the fiber workshop. Um, and this is what I ended up with. 
engineering, construction, basically operating, building and operating the system seems to me the first thing to understand um, a financial analysis, um, partnership opportunities, and to me then there's alternative system methodologies, um, case studies um, of various methodologies, and then kind of looking at what it all really means for Yellow Springs and looking at some kind of a risk analysis for Yellow Springs and then what we do next. Um, basically, you know, just how we move forward. Um, so it, it seemed to kind of um, condense things for me in my head as to how I was thinking about it and how do you both feel about it. I, I mean, I like the way you put it together. Um, the What I was wondering is if there's um, there's some experts out there who, like I say, can kind of look into the future, have some notions of how you know this technology um, is going to evolve over time. To sort of uh, um, competitions that could uh, that we, you know these kind of public uh, entities could end up running into. So I don't, I don't know. Well, I, I, I said risk analysis yeah, for Yellow Springs future technologies. I mean, in some respects, that's part of the risk. Yes, no, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, no, I agree it's here, but I'm wondering who are the people who can think about this? And I mean, maybe at well, this point, it's in Springs Nets' hand. I think I think what we need to do is is decide if we're going to, if we're going to take a next step. We need to understand from them what is the next step and if we're going to take it. And, um, you know, I feel like what I'm seeing that, that we, we have a pretty, that's a pretty, pretty expert team that they've got and, and together. Uh, Karen and Brian and I went to a presentation by someone that they had brought in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he, it was, I think he's a contractor, essentially. I think he's a person who builds fiber networks. Mm -hmm. um, Melissa and Johnny um, and I met with a, a, a gentleman from uh, Lebanon, correct? Mm -hmm. Um, and we actually were meeting with him about um, the, the metering, the net metering ordinance, because um, they, he's in charge of their utilities and he's, he's very knowledgeable about that and trying to work on revising that. But he was also there when Lebanon built their own and when they um, turned around and sold it to uh, Cincinnati Bell. And he, had, he, could, he could come and speak to us as to the reasons that they did that and how that worked out and, and why theirs didn't work. Because I know, Judith, that was something that you were concerned yeah, Burlington about. Yeah, did the same kind of thing where they right. ended up selling it. It was a public thing and they ended up having Right, and why there was a lot of yeah. lost the... He had a lot of what not loss. to do information kind of thing. So it might be helpful if, if we invite... His name is Sean Coffey, and it might be helpful to invite Sean, and we can certainly do that um, if you Yeah, want. I mean, well, I mean, he wasn't there when it happened. He came in after the fact. Right, but he, he very well explained what, what he saw as the issues of why it did not work for them. I thought he had a very good and knowledgeable explanation of that. So I think he How long ago was that? It, uh, 15, yeah. 10, 15, they were 15 years ago, I They think. were one of the first ones to try to do it. That's what and, and, and he, you know, he was saying things about, um, you know, they started out with just the internet and then of course people wanted the, the um, cable offerings mm -hmm. and if you offer the cable or you can't restrict, we have to offer everything and, and then everybody wanted the bundling and with the telephone and that was not a good thing for them. It didn't work out. It forced them a lot quicker than what they wanted to. Right, and so I think he has some good input for us. So perhaps we can invite Sean to come to that if you would like to. Um, it sounds, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, I hate to, I hate to have him <coughs> sit through a meeting that, you know, we wouldn't have that much input. Um, I mean, maybe you could even just ask for a quick email about, about it or something, just kind of a summary of what happened and I think we did we ask him? Uh, yeah, I mean, what well, do you think? I mean, you guys, yeah, we had talked about that and I said maybe he could, he could just write kind well, of. Well, this isn't going to probably be the final discussion. Right. Oh, yeah. We're not going to a decision right after this, right? So if we need additional information. Yeah, I mean, there I might mean, be good to get something written. Yeah, yeah. You can get, let's get, get a written something work quickly written from him. Mm -hmm. I think that would be good. But he was, I thought just sitting there listening to him about this is a good thing and this is a bad thing, you know, that kind of pros and cons was very helpful to mm -hmm. me. So, although I do think there, there was a little bit of that being talked about 
at the at the program that uh, the meeting that Marianne just mentioned. And I think things have changed. I think that there have been a lot of changes industry wide that um, are probably a little bit more amenable to, to what we're talking about doing. Right. Yeah, that was the very beginning. Right. This was more about logistics, about like don't dive right into offering the bundle and don't, you know, don't try to do the entire village at one time. That was part of their issue, I think he said. Um, so, okay, just Good. those kinds of things. So it sounds like that, you know, I think that even even the, the kind of <coughs> jumbled agenda we had last time seemed to be relatively, you know, seemed to be fine with Tim Barhorst and the committee. So I think if we give something that's a little bit more cogent that, you know, they'll certainly be fine. So at this point, I am just seeing, I'm seeing Springs Met, I'm seeing us, and I'm seeing staff. I think we are talking about doing it maybe, not doing it in here. Um, so we'll have, I don't even think Chris needs to be here unless you want to. What do you want to do? It seems to me you're still in that preliminary phase. Right. So. I mean, if you have any, if, you know, if there's anything that you can provide from a legal standpoint or any experience that any of your municipalities have had or anybody on your staff has had, that'd be great. I can tell you that the answer is none. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that will be the meeting. So it'll be, it'll be Johnny. Who, who else will be here? Johnny, Melissa, and I. Okay. What about the some from the schools? We've know they all know about it. I think what we decided is that is that this really is we're not really ready to engage them yet. It's like we need to understand a little bit yeah. more. I don't I don't want it to be a sales pitch right kind of thing. I, you know, so that's why I feel like we don't just want contractors. We don't just want people who are building these things. If, if that's what the, if that's what, we don't want just people who you know. So I, I, you know, so um, so I feel like the schools in the short term, it's a great idea. They love it. They're going to come and say, "Yeah, do I do it?" Right. I don't feel that that's very helpful to start with. We want to start, you know, we don't want to start it with a lot of pressure to just do it. We're already starting with a lot of pressure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the pressure. We don't want to maximize the pressure. Right. We want to maximize the exactly. connection. Think about it. And and that's what I I feel like I feel like we as council are are. Um, I feel like we, we understand and, and do understand the benefits and do understand the needs, but we still have to make that analysis of does it make financial and operational sense for the village, and that's where I feel like we are. We need to be, and that's what the discussion needs to be about without a great deal of discussion about how much it's going to help the village. I think we know that. So. Okay, so um, the only thing, I, Judy, if we could get this, we just added future tech, risk analysis. So to, to number five, we'll add future technologies. And then if we can get that to spring snap, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. What date is that? It's, it is June 8, 2016. It's a Wednesday night, not a Thursday or, or not a Monday. It's a Wednesday night, and it will be at 7 p.m., and it will be in A and B. And we really, it's a work session. It's an official council meeting. It's uh, more of a relaxed work session, and we would love as many people to be there as would like to be there. Uh, Mary Ann, do you want to report what uh, Environmental Commission decided or um, yeah. feels about? Yeah, well, we haven't had a uh, meeting, so we haven't been able to come together as a commission. Uh, but um, my understanding is that what we will be coming to council about is a suggested change in the current ordinance regarding lawn to include um, the option for people who want to naturalize their lawns and do native planting to allow that, um, which would include some grasses that go on. But in regard to the mowing for a regular grass lawn. An environmental commission, um, my, my sense is that uh, the two people, that, Nadia and Deward, who were looking into this, did not feel that the issue of uh, leaving the mow date till um, July, July 1 yeah. was really an environmental issue in terms of the nesting thing. Right. That, um, for people who have regular grass lawns, it's better for the grass to begin mowing it sooner mm -hmm. than that. And um, 
we weren't sure why that that date was put in and didn't really feel that it had anything to do really with wildlife nesting. So, so, so in terms of the looking at the environmental commission, we're just I think going to say you know we, we, that that's going to be more of a public nuisance thing I think at this point. But we are going to come with a suggested additional language for the ordinance to allow people who want to not use pesticides, really create more of a pollinator habitat and naturalize their landscape on um, legislation. Sorry. It, I did look at the legislation that actually set the mow date to be it actually says you don't have to move between, I think, April 1st and July 1st, and it does say specifically about nesting habitat, and, yes. and I'm sure it has to do with, um, you know, rabbits and mice and smaller things, and sometimes there's waterfowl that nest in high grass. But, but, but again, the, but, but, that, but, but that should be, as Mary Ann said, right. areas that are naturalized. I mean, right. Those should be intentional areas. Somebody is just, oh, I don't want to mow my grass, so right. I'm going to let it grow. Exactly. So and, and that's part of the problem is that people were saying right it's they but it, it says I don't have to mow mm -hmm. so I agree with everything Mary Ann said is what I'm oh, yeah but, but I don't know that really I, but are there larger grassy areas that are you know parts of people's lawns that they let grow longer and is that a problem but, um, generally I think we find that. Once people start mowing their grass, they they keep mowing it. And it's not if it if it's a, a normal grass lawn as opposed to a yeah. prairie grass or something like that. No, but I'm talking out. about some they people just, have larger pieces of plots of land where you know they're mowing part of it and maybe letting parts of it you know be more like a meadow, say, or something like that. It's not prairie grass. It's just grass that's allowed to you know that's almost more like a small field or something like that. Um. I don't know that the ordinance actually differentiates between that other than that's why I think they're at, they want to add the naturalized area language to, to the ordinance. It, the ordinance applies primarily to areas that are in lawn grass. Um, but that said, we do get complaints from people who are sometimes next to a field um, and they get small creatures and snakes and et cetera coming out and getting onto their property. Um, so generally, you have to bush hog at least a couple times a year if you have a field. Unless your field is planted in a prairie grass or something like that, there's an allowance for that. Um, so. Well, I, I'm going to express my personal opinion mm -hmm. um, that the fact that we have garter snakes and little animals yeah. and things is actually a good, a good and healthy thing. Mm -hmm. and the only way to eradicate those creatures would be to do things that I don't think we want to do, poison, things like well, that. Well, mowing the bush hogging their habitat <laughs> probably is doing a good job of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he, humans have taken over the habitat of like, the rest of life, so. I, I don't disagree, but <laughs> to the frequent complaints. Yeah. So. Are, there, are there complaints about, um, just pollen and allergies and things too, or is it mostly about? There are, but they're not as prevalent mm -hmm. as uh, you know. But my like the way it looks. Yeah. Well, yeah, my neighbor's not cutting his grass, and, and I'm getting my kids are getting triggers, and snakes are coming in my yard, and, and mice are getting in my house, and that seems a little <coughs> yeah, that, that seems like not a huge problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I. I don't know what was the, I mean, I think this came from staff, right? So the issue came from staff it because you were getting phone calls. We get regular <coughs> complaints this time of year um, from folks not cutting their grass and their neighbors. But we really can't, is there legislation that says you cannot mow? So without new there's, legislation? There's legislation that says you're not required to mow between April 1st and May or, or, and July 1st because of nesting habitat. That's what the legislation says. And then it doesn't say anything about how often to mow after that. It doesn't. And is this only around the perimeter, or is it the whole thing? Well, there's an allowance that says that you have to that you have to at least mow 
the perimeter that where your property abuts someone else's okay. property to, to minimize this from happening. And obviously to, to make sure that visibility and <laughs> correctability is. Correct. But you don't have to mow that perimeter between April 1st and July 1st. The rest of the year you have to mow it. Okay. It's very confusing. It's a lot simpler to say after your grass reaches a certain height, you gotta mow it, but that's not what our ordinance says. So did we decide that we really didn't, well, no. we can't decide no, that. I mean, but we I guess you're just gonna. And, and the environmental commission hasn't brought it right yet, but it's just a preliminary discussion. But mm -hmm. I don't think if that decision's gonna be made that it would come from the environmental commission, not the planning commission or council. Um, I mean, those larger fields are nesting habits for habitats for rabbits, mm -hmm. especially small, you know, rabbits. I mean, I, I you so know, and snakes, and yeah. so I don't know. I personally don't feel like it's a great idea to, have to tell people they have to mow that because there, there's some. I mean, I don't know how you might differentiate between that and an actual lawn. It's maybe a little different, but uh, but there are some larger properties. Well, several folks in my neighborhood have bought extra lots just to keep them in natural grasses. So. I mean, and that would be the, the perfect situation. I, I, I think, to me, it, it probably does maybe belong with Planning Commission because it is a little bit about adjacencies and expectations and, um, you know, how, how properties are, um, do impact one another. I mean, if you've got an acre, you can be a little bit more flexible with your acre than if you're on a 50 foot wide lot potentially <laughs> so i think so i mean we can refer it to planning if you want but the ordinance isn't part of the zoning code that's okay. that's why i didn't go there you can okay. certainly go there and let them make some kind of a recommendation maybe we should wait to hear from planning commission and, and i just to see what they about but you said you're going to bring something related to or did i say environmental Environmental Commission. Environmental Commission related to about this whole idea areas. of naturalizing areas. Okay. I mean, that's something that is new, just right. new, and and we haven't really thought of. And our our ordinance is obviously written around a lawn. It's written around. Grass. I think it would be good to have Nadia actually come and talk about it. Well, I think I think if it, it, it I think this should be consolidated. I think if we're going to talk about these two different subjects, an environmental commission is going to talk about one subject, and planning commission is going to talk about the other one. I think it needs to be a combined ordinance and everything in the same place. So I would suggest that perhaps Nadia and Dewar, um, who are the two folks from the environmental who have been working on this, um, maybe go to planning commission and talk to them about it and make it a joint effort so that we do this one time and we do it right. It seems to me it'd be useful for people in thinking about this to actually go around town and see what's happening out there mm -hmm. because, because, you know, because I think this town does generally not mow as much as most towns. And most people who mow are not mowing with a push mower. They're mowing with gas. You know, it's not very, so the whole issue is sustainability and so on. So anyway, uh, just uh, seems like it would be useful to just look around and see what our people are doing. And, where are the problems? Uh, right. Marion, for sure, if, if that's the direction that it needs to go, I'm sure the Planning Commission would uh, appreciate that coming in right first and then letting them sort of decide how they want to play. And I think it's I think it's an important discussion, and I, and I, but I think it is one that needs to be more thoughtful. It's actually one that people care about. Right. right. If you yeah. start, and I don't if think they've got some reason that they're not mowing, they've got some conscious thing they're thinking about in terms of environmentalism or something. It's not a decision that needs to be made quickly out yeah. and there's not an emergency out yeah. there. So I'd rather be thinking about it and, you know, maybe presenting it in a way that will encourage this kind of alternative kinds of landscaping. So are we uh, uh, going in the direction of having a couple of people from EC attend planning commission? Well, I heard, first of all, writing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think the next thing is planning commission maybe deciding how putting it back saying that what what council is looking at is maybe a more holistic kind of look at how about a, a 
Society and I write up some as to what her planning, what the question is. Her planning. Oh, as to what the question is. Yeah, yeah I that certainly you can do that. I thought we were talking about perhaps not even if you were writing up something about why they're they're approaching it. Like yeah, they are, and then combining that. And I'm thinking that, is that what you were saying? Or? Yeah, I think otherwise planning commission isn't going to quite know where that is coming from. Mm -hmm. they, right. they want a context for it. So right, yeah. Right, and Denise can certainly represent the the administrative offices. At least she's the person who normally gets the calls about it, mm -hmm. um, and so she's at planning commission meetings anyway. So. Well, well and another possibility is maybe Denise could go to a to an environmental commission meeting, or at least part of an environmental commission meeting, right. to, to kind of sit in on the, right. you know, and I mean, and, and Denise is in a perfect situation with where she lives now. I mean, she's in a, in a situation now where, you know, she lives in a, you know, on a lot of a more acreage and is, mm -hmm. you know, kind of looking at this kind of, of uh, um, growing situation. Where is she? Um, um, Houston. <coughs> oh, okay. And what about the, um, I'm forgetting what it's called, the network? Resilient. Resiliency <coughs> network, is this something relevant to the sustainability stuff there? Well, um, Nadia and Dewart are in both organizations. And on their moving Okay, great. Um, Patty, you're a manager's report. Do we have new business? We are one one thing I, I forgot, I didn't mention earlier, is um, Marianne and I did write a letter though in the Yellow Spruce News, you know, just talking about the Justice System Task Force, mm -hmm. and we've already gotten a couple of interested people. Mm -hmm. um, so just to let you know, um, Marianne's going on vacation, and I'm going to be in and out of town a bit this month, so we thought we'd give people a couple weeks, so it'll be in the paper this week, give them a couple weeks. So we're probably going to be uh, meeting with people towards the end of May. Okay. And then we're bringing recommendations to come. Okay. Uh, no new business. Okay. Patty? Um, streetscape phase three is, is moving right along. Um, the weather is not really cooperating with us, but we're doing pretty well. And thank you, Karen, for letting us know that Speedway was going to close down for a week to have their floors replaced because we were able to ask the contractor to move over there and do that section for the week that they were closed down so that we don't have to impact them twice. Um, so he, that's why he jumped across the street over there instead of continuing on down. Um, the contractor, Jason, came to me with a, a request from the contractor, Mark Fincham. Um, currently our ordinance says that um, they cannot start uh, demolition work, construction work, until 7 in the morning. Um, that does kind of impact <coughs> him as far as the traffic, because he's trying to get started right when traffic is probably at the worst. And his request is that he be allowed to start at 6 a.m. for the rest of the duration of this project. Um, it is an ordinance, so I don't really have the authority to tell him he can do that without the approval of council. Um, the rest of the project will be um, primarily between Glen and Limestone, or Short and Limestone. Um, so residences will be minimally impacted with the exception of the Mills Park Hotel, um, because the, you know, he's demolishing across the street from them. Um, so that is the contractor's request, and it is a decision of council um, whether you allow him to start at 6 a.m. or require him to continue to start at 7. I, I mean, I always, it, it, we're, only, we're talking about probably a week or two weeks. Correct. You know, I'm, I think that's fine. I would just ask that, that um, they be told, that the hotel be told that, and there are residents, there are people living in the funeral home, on the upper level of the funeral home. Um, so and that's really it. I mean, that's going to be it. It's going to be Mills Park. Right. It's going to be um, Fort, or Otten Gallery because um, Alan and Beth lives there and um, funeral home. Mm -hmm. And it may, I mean, it may spill over a little bit into the, into the adjacent houses. Down so, the corner, yeah. Uh, so your council is okay with that for the remainder. I mean, the, they are required to have the project done by day 27 at the latest, you know, barring monsoons coming in. Sure. And he is working quickly. Um, and he's, they're really working very quickly. So, um, 
but I think you should probably take a voice vote uh, to, to make this allowance simply because it is an ordinance. So um, it will impact people in the hotel. Oh yeah. Oh no, yeah. I said that. Yeah. Yeah, I know you did. But I'm just yeah. restating it because waking up at six o'clock in the morning. So are they going to do the demolition? I mean, is, is it intentional to do the demolition first thing in the morning, or is there? Well, a normally they start with some demolition and some pour. I mean, they, they're working both ends of this at the same time. Like they'll demolish here one day, and then that, the next day they'll demolish here and pour here, and then demolish here and pour here. Although the, the demo in front of the hotel will be minimal because they can, they'll just be able to grab that. It's not like they're gonna that they have to pound the concrete like they do the flat sidewalk. They'll be able to, to stick the, the forklift or whatever it is, the, the right. backhoe in there and pull those curbs right out. Right. There will be minimal noise. It, yeah, it's just when they're across the street. It's across, it's the, the across the street. And that was gonna you know, that was gonna happen. If I, if people in the hotel are probably not gonna care between six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning, they're probably not gonna be real happy at seven o'clock either. So I doubt that they're gonna if, um, the, if they can just be asked to be yeah. cognizant of that, yeah. you know, so they can do that piece of the work, that noisy part of that work. Ooh. Right. I mean, if they if they could, you know, it's starting at six piece, starting though. at six o'clock, if they could if they could at least delay the demo. I mean, that's what I would say. We're not yeah. saying that they have to, but if they could be thoughtful about the demo, um, not at six. And that's why you wanted to start at six. <laughs> the demo is why you wanted. To well, start that's. At six. A, Okay, start demo at six. Okay, um, okay, that's. So, can I get a motion that council is okay with them being thoughtful about <laughs> an earlier <laughs> start time? Oh, I, I move that uh, we uh, allow the, the contracting on the streetscape to be thoughtful with <laughs> demolition and de demolition starting at six a.m. Short term. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And I will ask him if he, you know, if he you know, <laughs> can work on that part a little bit later in the day. Perhaps yeah. work up by the bank in the church yeah. in the morning yeah. there where there's not people. No. Um, okay. Uh, the water, uh, the water treatment crew, um, as we noted earlier. Um, what is working on uh, some doing some things on the clear well and um, Brad did tell me they were filling it up and so hopefully that is going to move along um, just fine and uh, we don't have any problems with that. Uh, we are flushing hydrants next week. The closing on the home ink lots is scheduled for some time this week but apparently keeps changing according to my emails but this week. Um, We've already talked about the alleyways, the pedestrian traffic on Livermore Street. Um, another thing that came up while I was off was uh, about the folks who kind of come out from between the cars on Livermore Street down by South College near the Wellness Center and um, how we can alleviate that, that problem, make it a little bit more safe. Um, I spoke to Jason, I spoke to Chief, I spoke to Reggie Stratton. Um, everyone is in agreement that the best solution be that we move the stop signs from North College to South College and paint some crosswalks um, down at South College. Um, Reggie's in agreement with this. Um, I spoke. I had an email from him, and I also spoke to him today when I saw him at the Beyond Pesticides thing. And he is in, in agreement with it. He understands he's going to lose a couple parking spaces, but he's going to gain them back at the other end. And he feels that the pedestrian traffic at that end is, is far more prevalent. And so what we would need to do is, because we're removing one stop sign and we're actually placing another stop sign, um, I believe we have to bring some, some legislation before council to do that. So if, if council's in agreement, we will draft that legislation and bring it and uh, make that new stop signs from one to the other. So. And who's doing? Because my under my recollection is that it's it's gravel where that um, where the stop sign on the, the south end would go, because it's right in front of the it's it's where the gravel parking places are, and then I'm not even sure if there is any asphalt. So they'll is there going to be is is anybody going to add asphalt? Is there is there any structural work? Is there any road work that needs to get done to get 
I would say no, other than we'll probably remove the gravel and grass at back end so people know not to park there because if they see the gravel, they're going to continue to think that they can park there. You know, if there was anything, because I know I, that whole area, I think, is, is actually a bit of a pain for um, the college because people are parking, continue to park on their grass. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that could be a little collaborative <coughs> project mm -hmm. to benefit everybody that, that maybe we could end up asking you know, maybe the, we could collaborate with them on asphalting part of it. I'll talk and to Jason and have him get with Roger. And and marking the spots would be so much easier. Uh, I mean, maybe it, I don't know if it's something that that Jurgensen could throw in. Um, uh, that's a, yeah, that's under the county contract. And and speaking of which, will you say something about oh, the um, yes, the asphalt? That came in after my. Um, and I think it's it is important to note some people were. <coughs> Pretty shocked to first to see the signs right. with the road closing, with the fact that Dayton Street and other streets were closing, um, and then the, the quick turnaround because we've never had paving right. done at this time of year. Usually we're the last on the list, and this time they came to us first, I believe. Right, yeah. Um, Jason got a call, and it actually the call came after I submitted my report to, to Judy um, that they were going to come in and do our paving under the county collective contract. Um, early this year, like Karen said, we're usually the last one on the list, it's like they go alphabetically or something. Um, but um, they called it, uh, Thursday and said, hey, we're coming Monday. And we're like, ah. Um, we worked with some of the businesses downtown. There is a, there's a symposium going on at the, uh, the Arts Council, um, a, a, a symposium on Japanese art, and they're having people coming in from Okinawa. And, I mean, it was very uh, confusing, so, um, we were luckily able to work out a schedule that works with them on that. We milled Dayton Street today, um, but they're not going to pave it until Thursday. Um, that will allow parking for the symposium uh, for the two days that they have events there, and then um, they don't have anything on Thursday or Friday, so we'll, the, the contractor can come back and pay. Uh, meanwhile, he will go and pave the rest of the streets, which is Key Sally, um, High Street between South College and Herman. Um, Southgate Drive is going to be milled and paved, and there was one other one, um, and I can't remember. Cemetery? I got cemetery. Maybe, maybe it was cemetery, but um, anyway, we, we've alleviated the, the, the concerns that we were notified of, and we're able to work that out. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a shock. We're usually left until the last, and all of a sudden Jason calls me, he's like, ah, he's just there. Yeah. So, um, Luckily, we, we sent out a blanket email to everyone, and, and uh, people were able to get back with us very quickly so that we could make sure everybody's concerns were addressed. And it seemed, I mean, at, in the, at the end of the day, getting all of this work done before, you know, before the end of May is going to be absolutely incredible. And right. I feel like things are, are looking good. One thing that was brought up is that not having the planning, there was you know, are there things that we could have potentially done, like, you know, although this, if they, are they doing the marking or are we responsible for the markings? Are there the any? The markings are included in the, um, the markings are included in the contract. Okay. So. Okay, great. Um, Melissa. Um, I didn't have anything prepared for the packet, but I did receive a draft of our audit on Thursday. And I'm excited that it's a clean audit. So Good job. Um, I'm hoping that uh, we will have a um, formal audit um, copy completed, not in draft form, um, very soon. So Great. that's and, all for me. And I Thank would you. like to compliment Melissa on that. A clean audit is for someone, a, a finance manager, this is what I did at, at the jail. That is an amazing accomplishment, and it's always a feather in the cap. So, good job. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, Judy? Uh, nothing big. Just I'm out for a bit on Friday for an OMCA planning thing, and the cool news about that is that they chose, they did choose Yellow Springs as the destination for their training in 2017. Unfortunately, not enough hotel rooms, so it shifted to Hope Hotel, but there will be a lot of clerks flooding the area July of 2017, no doubt. Great. Uh, let's see, future agenda items. Um, so we, um, I think the next is it? Pardon? Judy following for us. At some point in the future, we're going to be talking about utility bills. That's going to be after discussion between Marianne and, and, uh, and Melissa. Mm -hmm. 
May 16th, um, we will have the first resolution um, regarding the annexation of the Glen. I think we will have another piece of legislation related to the sale of Sutton Farm. We'll have legislation on stop signs. Um, we'll have the second reading of the ordinance um, on um, landfill gas stop sign. And unless, I mean, if anything comes up, we'll let you know. And you'll miss that meeting, right, Marianne? You'll, you'll be missing the next meeting. Okay. So we won't, we'll, we'll, that, we won't have the utility discussion at that point. Yep. We'll definitely save that. So, um, okay. And it looks like um, we have an executive session uh, for the purpose of the discussion of potential litigation. I would entertain a motion with our solicitor president. Entertain a motion. Yes. Okay. Wintrow. Yes. <clears throat> Templin. 